I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Welcome to the Fidelis Leadership Podcast, a place of learning for those who aspire to leadership excellence. Here's our host, Mike Etor. Jennifer Arvin Furlong is the founder and CEO of Communication 24-7 and host of the Communication 24-7 podcast. She is an author, a TEDx speaker, and coach. Jen is a communication expert whose passion is to help others solve their most difficult communications issues by helping them develop more effective verbal and nonverbal communication skills. Her professional development programs are informed by her more than 30 years experience as a communications specialist and 18 years experience as a communications professor. A Marine Corps veteran, Jen was the first woman to be awarded the Sergeant Major Dan Daly Award and the first woman Marine to be appointed editor of the Quantico Century, the Marine Corps' oldest newspaper. She is a first-generation college graduate with bachelor's and master's degrees in communication, a PhD candidate, a mom, wife, and a breast cancer survivor, which means she doesn't believe in I can't. Jen, welcome to the Fidelis Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is really awesome. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Well, a little bit of trivia, a little trivia question up front. Sergeant Major Dan Daly Award. You know who Sergeant Major Dan Daly was, obviously. Oh, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, what he, he was called, what, the fightingest Marine? Yeah. So, like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so he's the one at Bella Wood when it was time to stand up and charge across the wheat fields. He said, come on, you sons of bitches. Do you want to live forever? Love it. And <laughs> do you, so a little trivia test. Do you remember, aside from that, what he was famous for? What he's, he's, he's famous for, he's only, he's one of, two Marines in the entire history of the Marine Corps that received the Medal of Honor, right? Yes. Yeah, Twice? He's, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. He was the only two-time recipient, him and Smedley Butler. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think it was, I think it was Smedley Butler is, is the one that actually said that, yeah, he's the fightingest Marine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and some more trivia, and then we'll get on to the actual podcast, but you were stationed at Quantico. And do you remember the stadium at Quantico, how it was sunk into the ground? Remember the, the, uh, the, the athletic field was not raised up. It was actually in, yeah, it was Smed, yeah. Smedley Butler was a CG of the base then. And he had Marines as slave labor dig that out with shovels. Oh no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> No, no bulldozers for Smedley, you know, manual. That's labor. right. Yeah. That, that was, <laughs> well, they was, did a uh, fantastic job at yeah. leveling that out and everything. <laughs> so it, when I read that, I was like, damn, working parties even back then, you know? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Jen, we could talk about the Marine Corps all day. I, I know we've talked a little bit in, already and we both love it and uh, shaped our lives for sure. Uh, but the, the intro was great. You're an impressive person. That said, Give us a little bit more. What more do we need to know about Jen, the person? Yeah, sure. Um, You know, outside of that, I I guess just I'm I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia. You know, I I grew up in that area and um, I come from a background. um, It wasn't the the ideal, you know, background for a, a, a child to grow up in broken home. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of violence in the home, you mm. know, drug abuse. And, um, so I would go back and forth, you know, between my mom's place and my dad's place, you know, yeah. lived in section eight housing and it was just, um, not a very good environment for a child to grow up in. And, you know, by the time I got into middle school, I ended up finally settling down at my dad's house because I really liked the school system and I had a bunch of friends there and I felt like that's where I best fit in, you know, despite the fact that it was still a rough home life living with him. But by the time I graduated high school, I just kind of, I, I embedded myself into my high school community. And I think that's really what made the difference for me, you know, um, coming out of that type of situation. I was, 
um, the, I was in the marching band and I was the drum major my senior year. So I was the queen, uh, marching band geek, you know, (laughs) and, uh, I loved English and loved writing. And so, uh, I was on the yearbook staff, you know, and I played fast pitch softball. So, uh, you know, loved in the athletics. And so I just really loved, um, being a part of a community where we were just constantly, uh, you know, lifting each other up. And so by the time I graduated, unfortunately, college wasn't in the cards for me at that time because we had no money and I had no idea about financial aid and all of that stuff. I was completely ignorant to how the higher education system worked. So I figured, hey, you know what? I'm going to join the military and make it even better. I'm going to be a Marine. And then yeah. everybody just thought I was insane after that point. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and, and that was a, that was a journey in itself, just making that decision. And at that time, you know, and it was 1991 and my recruiter had never put a female in the Marine Corps. Uh, before. Okay. And, um, he wasn't, I don't think he was about to start with me because I, when I showed up, I surprised him and showed up at at the office and he sat me down at his desk and he walked to the back where the gunny was and I could hear them talking. And I heard him say something like, you know, there's this girl out here. What do I got to do to get rid of her? And then I heard the gunny say something like, well, give her all the tests. And when she fails, you know, you can get rid of her. And so I, yeah. It, and so sitting there listening to this, um, frankly, it kind of pissed me off. I was yeah. like, okay, uh, I got some work to do here. I'm not going to yeah. leave. I am not leaving. <laughs> yeah, those were, uh, those were tough. Those were tough. I know what you went through. Those were tough times. I, yeah. I was on the staff of the basic school around the time that you went in and, uh, they started integrating female officers into mm-hmm. male platoons and um, th- that idea was not warmly received. Right. Uh, yeah. And so yeah. I, I remain friends. Uh, and, and I did not receive it warmly. I was not anti-female mm-hmm. whatsoever. Um, I was worried about standards, physical standards right. dropping, you right. know, and all yeah. of that. And uh, but I enjoyed being around the lieutenants. And I am uh, still in touch with a good number of those female officers, the retired lieutenant colonels yeah. and colonels and all of that. And uh, they always said, yeah, Mike, you know, what we walked into in 92, 94, these these young girls in 2010, they don't even <laughs> they don't even know how good they, they got it. You know? They don't know. So it's, it's the, like it's the old core, new core thing. All right, over yeah, what again. we had to deal with. Yes, it's, exa- <laughs> it's exactly what they say. But, you know, from your experience, there's a lot of truth to that. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is though, I, one of the things that I've learned about the, the value of, of practicing grace is I understand at the time that was a huge shift and, you know, my recruiter hadn't put a female in the Marine Corps before. So we're afraid of what we don't know. Right. Yes. And I'm sure he was afraid if, if I screwed up, if I wasn't a good representative of, you know, the type of recruit that, you know, we're looking for alpha recruits and you don't, you don't want to be the guy that screws up and (laughs) put somebody in that's going to, you know, make you look bad. But, you know, I, I had a important decision to make. I, I realized that I could have left and I could have gone to the papers and I could have complained about it. And I could have made him look bad. The gunny looked bad, the Marine Corps, right. you know, I could have make, made the entire organization look bad, but I realized, you know what, I really want this. And maybe this is something that it's my job right now to prove a point, you know, yeah. maybe I need to be be a good example, set an example. So yeah, yeah. I convinced him, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was in shape cause I was, you know, athletic and I was pretty smart. So of course the ASVAB score was pretty yeah. nice. And, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, I went to Paris Island and I ended up graduating in the honor platoon. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're in the honor platoon, they, bring your recruiter in. And so he gets all these kudos and his name is called out as the recruiter for, you know, the, this alpha recruit. Right. And, um, so by then we were actually laughing about the whole thing because yeah. I, uh, you know, he realized it, it was a yeah. big change, but you know, I think, 
I think all of us learned some valuable yeah. lessons through that experience. Yeah, I agree. And and while for the listeners, while we've been talking the unique experience, specific Marine Corps to you, um, I think you've already said it. I mean, it. I think it it does apply in the business world. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We, we we are afraid. Um, I I know pre COVID, um, I embraced as an executive the work remote. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and my, my fellow executives allowed me to do it and were wildly successful. Uh, most of them were like, you go for it, Mike, you do it. I'm not doing that. And then of course COVID came and they were terrified. And this particular group of folks I'm talking about, not only did they have to do it during COVID, they embraced it and they had record years in their company mm. d- during COVID. Wow. Everybody remote. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Isn't that so amazing? It is amazing. And so they, you know, I never gloated and said, I told you. So a few of them reached out and said, you know, you tried to tell us. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and so, yeah. So anyway, listen, before we go too far, um, you know, we're all about leadership here. And before you start talking, I want to provide some context to the audience. What do you do, Jen? Like who, what, what's your company do? Who are your clients? What do you do for your clients? Why do they call you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I created communication 24 um, seven in, in the middle of the pandemic, like many business owners, they decided <laughs> to go out on their own and create something new. Let's try this out. And I was no different. So March of 2021, I officially, you know, hung out my, my shingles, well, my virtual shingles, if you will. Yeah. Um, I taught my last two classes for Georgia Southern university. I had a couple of summer classes and uh, I closed that chapter and then really started hitting the road, um, seeking out clients. And so um, people who come to me, uh, usually organizations who want to make sure that their workforce um, has the communication skills that they need in order to perform well. Yeah. You know, so uh, they uh, specifically managers, I that's my bread and butter. I love to work with managers, specifically managers who are pretty new to the game, because what will happen is you're an excellent worker. You do a fantastic job. Congratulations. You get this big promotion. And now all the skills that you used to get that promotion don't mean crap anymore yeah. because now you're in charge of people. Yeah. And so, and, and so that's what I do. They, they come to me so I can make sure that, um, you know, within the organization, they, they understand how to create a healthy communication climate so that, you know, um, the, the workforce can have a positive impact on the culture. And so it's, it's yeah. created and maintained, you know, those workplace relationships. And that way you can learn how to um, adapt to different communication styles, how to give feedback more effectively, how to re- receive feedback effectively and, and how to, you know, manage conflict yeah. in a healthy way and, and build, you know, turn your group into a team, into a high functioning team. And, and so that's, that's really what I love to do. Um, yeah. and I'm having a blast with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I love it. Well, listen, before we go any further, a canned question, I ask everybody, mm-hmm. if you were limited to two or three sentences, uh, you know, I, I got exposed to you for 90 seconds and Jen, what's your leadership philosophy? What would you tell me? I think as a leader, it's really important to have a clear vision and to be able to express that vision clearly, to be able to express what your expectations are and to have high expectations. Um, But to also, you know, in addition to being firm, I think you also need to be kind. Um, And in addition to being courageous, you know, I think you need to be humble, be willing to listen. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think treat everyone from top to bottom with respect. And the number one thing I think your role as a leader is to empower others so that they can be successful. Yeah, I hear you. Well, listen, that's a great answer. It brings me right into the next one. Leaders born or made. I don't think it's an either or scenario necessarily. You know, I, I think people are placed into different scenarios and life happens. And um, sometimes we rise to the occasion and, and other times we don't rise to the occasion. So I think it's a, a combination of understanding what your strengths are 
and being aware of how those strengths can um, help solve the problems that are set before you and um, being willing to also recognize that maybe I don't have a strength in this area, but you know, I can find someone who does have a strength in this area. I think that's a learned process. You know, I think um, leadership is something that we might have certain strengths that come natural, Yeah. but just like any athlete, right? It, you can have a natural talent for something, but if you don't develop it, you know, learn about it and, and try to um, be intentional in making that, um, turning that, you know, uh, strength into a, a true talent, um, then those skills, you know, are wasted, you know, they won't be developed. So I do think it's a combination. Yes. Both. Well, you know, brings me in, we're going to start talking about your expertise now, obviously, which is among other things, communications. And you've, you've worked with a lot of executives as of I, and of course we've seen all these case studies about really high achieving executives. I mean, these people are kicking ass and they derail themselves yeah. with a lapse of communication skills, mm-hmm. verbal, um, writing, uh, just planning, just public relations and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. I know you've seen some examples. Can you give us again, our audience just wants to become better leaders what do you usually see as the typical ways people can derail themselves uh, via communications mistakes? And most of them, I would think you'll agree, are probably easily avoidable, too. Yeah, they are very easily avoidable. And, and I'm sure um, a lot of your listeners are probably already aware that, you know, there was a there is an ongoing study. Harvard Business Review has has been doing this study. I think it's like since 1995. So it's been mm-hmm. going on for a long time. And, um, you know, they looked at it's like over 18,000 C-suite leaders and, you know, over 2000 CEOs. And the overarching question was, you know, why are so many of these C-suite leaders not getting to the level of CEO, why are they becoming derailed? You know, and um, because these are high performers, right? These are people who, I mean, they're C-suite. So obviously they, they're, they're good leader. They're great leaders, but what is that thing that's holding them back? And they did find that um, more times than not, it is, it, it is the things that, you can actively work on if you are aware that it's a problem in the first place. And communication skills was a huge piece of that. And um, in some of the specific areas, you know, for example, like executive presence, you know, if you uh, seem like you're a little too timid to be a leader, you know, so that you can lead with a strong vision, lead from the front, you know, um, your, your peer relationships, um, you're really good in your own department. Like, you know, everybody, everybody loves you in your own department, but you have no idea what's going on in any of the other departments. So you just don't get out of your own, you know, area to forge those relationships. And then, you know, and in other things like, um, just excessive optimism, like, Mm -hmm. Whoa, everything, you know, everything's great. And then what that does is it, it, it either shows that, um, you don't know how to read the room, right? Like you're not aware of the reality of what's going on, or you're just refusing to see the reality of, of what's going on. And, you know, and then just being able to adapt to all of these different personality types, different scenarios, and, you know, be mindful of that and, and understand how to adapt your communication style, you know, so that you can have more influence and, and, be more persuasive and forge those relationships that you need to, and be able to maintain those relationships as well. Well, I love it. You said a lot there. And I know that you, one of the terms that you use is that of the empowered communicator. Yeah. yeah. Um, What, what qualifies one as an empowered communicator? Um, I think the first example of someone who is an empowered communicator is they absolutely understand that they cannot control how anyone else behaves, how they act, how they react, the things that they say, 
you know, there, you just don't have any control over that. What you do have is control over yourself, you know, yeah. um, and, and the things that you do and the things that you say, you know, and your reactions. So you learn how to develop this mindfulness of, you know, observing what's happening around you. And then as you're observing, you're also thinking about, all right, what can I do or what can I say in this moment that is going to have a positive impact, you know, on the situation, or I'm going to be able to have the impact that I think this situation warrants, you know, what does this situation require? So that mindfulness is very important. That's the first step right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the, the second step is actually knowing um, that you have to adapt your, your listening style depending on different situations, you know, it is possible to use the wrong listening style <laughs> depending on what's going on. Yeah. And so if you can learn, you know, how to, how to switch those, that's, you know, that's, that's powerful as well. And then learning how to speed read others, you yeah. know, try to try to understand what their communication style is so that you can adapt to them. And again, you can be more influential in that way. Yeah. I'm going to ask you several more questions. And the one I'm about to ask you probably should be asked toward the end, but I want to ask it up mm -hmm. front um, because I think your answers to the follow-on questions will show mm -hmm. these executives why, and this is the question, mm -hmm. why should C-level and senior executives and those who aspire to be senior executives, why, and they're already there to your point, they've already yeah. made it, you know, why, mm -hmm. why should they invest in developing, further developing and refining our communication skills? Yeah, well, two big reasons. Um, and both of them have to do with poor communication from top down can have a profoundly negative impact on your organization. And, you know, and, and that's to the tune of, I mean, millions of dollars if you're a large organization. And e even if you're a small business, I mean, it could be to the tune of, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. poor communication um, is the catalyst for a lot of those issues. And it also, you know, is something that it, it's not just the bottom line that could be negatively impacted. It is um, the perception you know, that, um, that the community has of your organization, the perception that your employees have of you, you know, as a leader. And so if you want to be able to create as well as maintain relationships with people who are going to keep your organization rolling the way you want it to roll and you want to, to steer it, you know, in the direction you want it to go, um, it, the workforce is your most important asset to make that happen. And so if, if you don't know how to effectively motivate others, you know, through communication, um, then you're setting, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. You know, so, so that's why I encourage, you know, not only C-suite level to continue developing their communication skills, but in make it an investment in their workforce, you know, um, it's the one investment that you really need to have and, and make sure that it, it's a part of your overall communication strategy, your communication plan, because look, we're all human and um, we're all a work in progress and not every tip that you read about is going to work in every single scenario. So it's, it's a constant process of improvement. You know, none of us ever get to that, get to that place where we, we just have nothing left to learn Yeah, because I, people will surprise you every day. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. And along those lines, I know you, I know there are different communications channels. So first I'd like to, mm -hmm. you to give us a couple examples. What are different communication uh, channels and how do they affect the messages, yeah. the various types of messages that, that leaders have to send? Yeah. Well, in terms of 
so we have like this communication process that happens and we know, you know, communication is such a difficult thing because there's all kinds of things happening at the same time. It's not as simple as me talk, you listen, because if it were that simple, we'd never have any miscommunication. So, you know, in, in terms of the messages that we are sending, of course, we have to be mindful of the, the language, right? The words that we choose to use um, will have an impact on the person who's receiving. So the message you send may not necessarily be the message received. So I have to really think and be mindful of that and think about my language choice. But then I also have the nonverbals that I got to worry about as well. So, you know, so that's, that's another channel through which we send messages. I, I need to be aware of uh, my body language, my posture, my facial expressions, you know, all of those. Um, the reason those things are so important and how they connect with communication styles. Um, I'll give you an example as to why this is important to understand how all putting all this together. If you are a leader who has an action oriented communication style, and that means you very much like things to be brief to the point, you're probably the person, if somebody asks you a yes or no question, you're going to give a yes or no answer because, hey, that's what you asked. Um, you probably really enjoy looking at charts and graphs because all the information is right there in one spot. Um, chit chat might drive you a little crazy because, look, we have a meeting. Here's the agenda. We got a lot of work to do. Let's focus <laughs> yeah. on this, right? Yeah, is, this, yeah. is this resonating? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But if I, let's say one of my directors is a people oriented communication style, their value orientation is um, they're going to be very focused on the relationship. They're not so focused on the bottom line. They are the ones who they do want to have chit chat. They're the, they're off, they're the office cheerleaders, you know, yeah. and they're the ones who they might be accused of maybe being a little too emotionally invested. You know, they're the ones that everybody goes to when they got to complain about something. So you can imagine that an action oriented person and a people oriented person, they could do this a lot, especially if they're not understanding yeah. where the other one, you know, is coming from. So that's why it's important to be mindful of the language we choose to use, how we're expressing it, you know, um, sometimes if you are that action oriented person, if I want to be able to influence the people oriented person, I know when I go into see them, I might be willing, I, I might need to be willing to spend the first five minutes asking about little Johnny and how yeah. his soccer game went, you know, over the weekend, yeah. you know, um, now there are also other channels that have a huge impact, you know, on the communication situation. And, and that's, um, whether or not we think we need to have a face-to-face -face conversation, or is this something we could talk over the phone about, or is this something we could use, you know, video, you know, zoom to have a conversation, or can I just, can I send you an email or, or can I just shoot you a quick text? You know, those different choices that we have will also have a huge impact on how that message is perceived. So, um, you, you really have to consider in the grand scheme of things, how important is this message? And do I need to allow for a certain amount of questions? You know, is this going to require a conversation? Cause we need to be able to figure this out together. Um, a quick text message is not going to, if you have a problem to solve, you cannot do that over text message, Yeah, you know? So that's another, uh, another aspect of the different channels that we have to consider and, and how they might have an impact yeah. know, being able to effectively manage those scenarios. Yes. I agree with that. I, 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 I am aware of far too many people, especially the younger generation who are tech savvy, overly tech savvy in some cases, they often want to do everything via text. Yeah, yeah. And uh mm -hmm. and and I tell people <laughs> put the phone away, actually stand up and walk down 10 cubes and talk to that person. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um there's a secondary thing that's happening when you ask them to do that. You know, it's it's not just about the information, it's about that relationship. Yes. yes. You know, I, I think a, a, in the younger generation, I hear an awful lot of concern from them about how they feel like 
they just don't have the relationships Mm -hmm. that they wish they had, you know, and well, that requires effort, right? It it requires work on your part to be able to, to create that. And, and what you're, you're giving them an opportunity by telling them, put the damn phone down and go down and, and talk to them because that's how you develop the relationships. Yeah. You know? I want to, I want to expand upon that a little bit. I am a fan of the younger generation. I mean, you, you know, I'm older than you, obviously a lot older. And, but I was the young guy once I was that younger yes. generation that they, oh, these guys ain't, you know, ain't shit. You know, they just, you know, yeah. Young, oh yeah. They yeah. called me a Pepsi generation, you know, yeah. late sixties, <laughs> early days. Yeah, you guys ain't crap, you know? <laughs> Face that in the Marines and then in life in general and all of that. And uh, so I'm a fan of the young, younger people, 30 and under. Mm-hmm. That said, I think it's what you just said is relevant, but I want to expand upon it because they are tech savvy. They know platforms. They know social media. They're wizards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when they get out to the business world or just life in general, but especially the business world, yeah. so much of the success of them at every level, if you're working in the mailroom, it depends on your relationships <clears throat> with people and 360 degrees around you. And I tell people mm-hmm. I want to so I'm serving up for you is all else being equal the ability to foster good relationships, cultivate and enhance good relationships, all else equal face-to-face. Yes. Go Mm -hmm. talk to them, make an excuse to go talk to them. And even with the remote going on, um, get as face-to-face as you can. If you, instead of constantly emailing them, do a zoom, whatever, but we are still human beings. And if we were doing this podcast right now, it would be good if we couldn't see each other, but the fact that we can see each other to me, I don't know what it is. You, you know, because it's your profession, but you tell us, what is it that that face to face does for us? Yeah. It it's, it's the humanity in it, right? Mm -hmm. When you can see someone else and you're, you can see how they're responding to you. You're reading their facial expressions, their body language, you know, you know, when you're telling a story or you're sharing something with somebody else and they tend to, they lean in and you can tell they're into it. And, and that right there, that begins to create that sense of trust, you know, yeah. that bond yep. that, that you want to be able to cult- cultivate. And in any organization, look, things are going to happen, right? At some point, there is going to be a problem. We can't help it. And at some point, people are going to disagree on something. There's going to have conflict. And if you have been able to cultivate that relationship, you've been able to create, you know, that, that bond and that sense of trust, then when those bad things do happen, when those challenges do present themselves, you are only going to be in a better position to be able to manage that more effectively, because it's, it's really difficult to try to manage conflict when there is, when there are people involved and you don't even know each other very well and you don't trust each other, you know, that makes it so much more difficult to be able to handle those types of situations. So Mm. um, yeah, it's, it's the humanity of it. You know, I, we make a connection um, individual to individual person to person, human to human, you know, that at the end of the day, that's what it's all about making that connection. Yeah. I want to throw out an anecdote that happened to me in 1999 and it's relevant today and you'll see where I'm going with this. So I, I retired from the Marines and I got with a company named K force and they had about 85 offices around the country. And I was at the corporate headquarters. And at this point I didn't know hardly anybody in the company. You know, I could probably count on two hands who I knew. And there was an individual that was emailing me and didn't have any angst against me, but, what I had been tasked to do kind of impinged upon his area. And yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it was communicated. Well, Hey, Paul, we're going to have Mike do this, help him out. Mm-hmm. And so it came as a shock. Like who the hell is this guy? Why is he doing it? And I'm supposed to support it. And he was sending me emails and I was sending them back and I could tell he was a little myth, but I, you know, remained professional 
And then all of a sudden, somehow I realized he was in the same office as me. He was no more than 25 feet away from me. Wow. wow. I, didn't, I did not know that. So I'm going to make a fake name. I stood up and said, are, are you Paul Smuckatelli? <laughs> yes, I am. I said, I'm Mike Etor. We've been emailing. I said, I didn't know you were here. He goes, oh, I, I didn't, you know. And so we went downstairs at the coffee bar to have a coffee. And within 20 minutes, that guy became a friend, an ally, and we're still in touch. In fact, I, I had a leadership uh, event one time and I invited him to come yeah. teach. But my point, 25 feet away. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was kind of testy. Yeah. Fa face to face. <laughs> All stress melted immediately because I'm like, look, I, I bet you weren't spun up on this, were you? And yeah. am, am I treading on your territory? How can we work together on this? And he said, yeah, you're right. And 25 feet away. And yeah. so that 25 feet still exists or that Zoom call distance still exists. So I wanted yeah. to get you, you know, I think it reinforces what you just said, but it's yeah. an example literally 25 years ago that I think is relevant today. Oh, absolutely. And, and the thing is, you know, we're going to fill the blanks in with, with our imaginations. And so when we get behind a computer screen, right. And we're not privy to having that type of conversation with somebody, you're just going back and forth through, through email. When you read an email, you're reading it through your frame of reference. So if I already have somewhat of a negative mindset, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to form my own picture of who this guy is because I'm not getting a good feeling. So now I'm beginning to interject I, my own negativity, you know, onto what I'm reading. And I could be going in the completely wrong direction. Whereas if I could just sit down and have a conversation with that person, that's not going to give me the room to fill in with my imagination, you know, all of the negative things that I'm assuming are going on. And not to mention, it's a hell of a lot harder to be a jerk to someone when you're sitting with them face to face and you start sharing stories and you start yeah. beginning to understand, oh, you know, this is a guy sitting across from me, just like me, you know, yeah. like we're, yeah. we're pretty similar. This is, this is actually, we're making a bigger deal out of this than what it really needs to be. It's really difficult to do that when you're face to face with somebody versus sitting behind a computer screen and you have that that cloak of invisibility you think you know yeah. that exists and so yeah. now yeah uh, you know so that there's several things that that are happening at the same time um mm. that really works against us and causes that miscommunication to happen yeah well next a natural segue into you know i i think people are listening to what you're preaching here i i love it and I think we all want to be, every, all of us want to be good leaders. And to be a good leader, you have to be at least an effective communicator. So if yeah, you were standing yeah. in front of a group of leaders, ranging from sea level all the way down to entry level, um, mm -hmm. can you give us just a handful of general communications tips that yeah. all else being equal, if you can do A, B, C and avoid doing D, E and F, you're generally going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if you learn to practice the platinum rule, which means treat others the way they want to be treated, um, because that requires you to put ego in the back seat, mm. and it really requires you to focus on that other person and try to get to know them, you know, and what makes them tick, what are their likes and dislikes, values, beliefs, um, that enables you to be able to adapt you know, um, like earlier, I said, we all have different communication styles. So learning how to speed read someone so that you can treat them the way they want to be treated. Yeah. Um, a second thing earlier, I had mentioned the communication or I'm sorry, the listening styles learn when to use your empathic listening versus your critical listening skills. Nothing will get us in trouble faster than somebody comes to us and they're just trying to vent, right? They're just having a bad day. They just need to get some things off of their chest. The worst thing we can do is have the critical listening on and then be like, well, did you try this? Or why didn't you do that? 
what happens? They get mad at you because you're not giving them what they need in that moment. So yeah. learning, learning how to switch between empathic listening. And that means just shutting up, listening and, and uh, being able to just empathize with them on an emotional level. I can understand why that would be so upsetting. You know, I, I get it. I, I'd be, I'd be pretty upset with that as well. You yeah. know, is there anything I can do? And yeah. oftentimes that's all they need. Um, so the adaptability of, you know, learning how to treat others the way they want to be treated, learning how to adapt between different listening styles, between empathic listening, um, as well as critical listening. Um, and then I think a third thing that uh, anyone can easily work on um, is just the relationship building, practicing having a conversation with someone, mm. you know, just walking up to a person and ask them, how's your day going, you know, and, and just, is there any, how can I be of service, you know, and, and listening to them who doesn't want to feel acknowledged, who yeah. doesn't want to feel like they matter or that their ideas, you know, aren't taken seriously. Who doesn't want to feel like they're making a contribution? If yeah. you can be the type of person to allow someone else to answer those questions and to pay attention to them, you will be considered the best conversationalist ever, the best communicator ever without even really having to say anything Yeah, because you are, because you are giving them the feeling that, Hey, I'm being acknowledged you know, they're listening to me. And even if they disagree with me, at least, you know, I'm, I'm able to participate in yeah. a way that makes me feel like, you know, I matter. Yeah. So have those conversations, ask those questions and allow someone else, you know, to tell you their story and, and learn from it. Yeah. Well said. I'm going to shift to a different area now. As you know, I'm a developer of leaders. And so I'm big on accountability and resilience and self-empowerment and all of that. And going back to your own Marine Corps career, we've chatted a little bit about this. I don't know the specifics, so I'm going to ask you to share as much as you'd like to. I know that you had an incident in the Marine Corps where you made a mistake and uh, you experienced a serious setback. You got reduced in rank, and which is a crushing blow. Uh, yeah. For, oh, for, yeah. You, for you civilians that don't know, that would be like being a vice president in a company and making a mistake and the CEO calls you in and says, guess what? Uh, you're not a vice president anymore. You're a, you're a director now or a right. manager. Yeah. And, and yeah, by the way, your pay's going down too, you know, right. I <laughs> uh, just, just want to paint that for the civilians who don't know what being reduced in rank means. Um, but you admitted it was a lapse in judgment. Um, but you came back, you, you know, I think you probably sulked a little bit and then, but you came back and you, uh, and you got that rank back. So would you like to share us that, that story? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talk about uh, being humbled, right? When you're a young Marine, you just think you are it, right? I mean, we were just hot stuff <laughs> and uh, there's nothing you can't do. And sometimes when you're 19 and <laughs> you just, <laughs> you, we're not, you know, I think our brains aren't fully developed or something, right? No, no doubt. No, and you just really make really bad decisions. So my bad decision um, had to do with um, a relationship I had with another Marine. And, um, you know, like we were talking about earlier in the early 90s, you know, we were still going through this shift of integrating women and everybody getting used to working together. And, you know, there's just, a, it was a, a time of, big change. And so in addition to that, when I was at school, I was at DENFOS defense information school at the time it was at Fort Benjamin Harrison, um, uh, in Indianapolis. And so we all had the barracks, you know, that we lived in and you were separated by floors. So the women were on floor, one floor, men were on another floor and you weren't supposed to mix. Mm. Well, you know, you have a bunch of young people getting together and we're like, woohoo, we're partying. Yeah. Well, we had a surprise inspection and, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we got into a lot of trouble 
because we were not supposed to be mingling on each other's floors and each other's rooms. You know, a lot of that was going on. And so we got smacked down pretty quickly and it was incredibly embarrassing. I was disappointed in myself. I felt like I had, um, let myself down. I thought that I held myself to higher expectations and I allowed the excitement and the bad decisions and the peer pressure, you know, all of that being so young, that party atmosphere that was happening. I allowed that to take over and I started making really bad decisions and that bad decision that just so happened at that time, we got all got busted because I guess everybody knew what was going on. And so, you know, they decided to have a surprise inspection. So yeah, I got busted down in rank and pay. And like I said, it was completely humiliating because I was in journalism school at the time and I was still in broadcast journalism school. And so we were learning how to present ourselves and introduce ourselves. And I'll never forget the first day after that, I had to introduce myself as PFC versus Lance Corporal. And Ugh. that stung in, in, but I had, I had to do what I had to do. Right. right? I couldn't say, well, I quit. There's no quitting. Right. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you just have to suck it up. And, um, you know, and I just, I realized, wow, that was a big mistake. I really do need to think about the choices I'm making and how it's impacting others perception of me because, um, our, our staff sergeant at the time, uh, took me into his office and had a heart to heart with me as well, because he knew that, I was a good Marine. I was a hard worker that, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, he had every faith in me, you know, confidence in me that I was going to rise above this. So he, he didn't want me to get too discouraged, but he also at the same time wanted me to understand, look, you know, you really do need to think about the decisions you're making because not only because you're wearing this uniform, you Mm -hmm. know, and what it represents, but you are a female Marine and you know that there are some expectations around here that naturally that you don't belong and you're going to screw up. And when he said that to me, I was like, you know what? You're right. I really do need to, I need to hold myself up to a higher standard. And so I didn't complain about it. You know, yeah, I cried about it because it was so humiliating, but I wasn't going to complain about it. I was like, I got to, I got to take this medicine and I just got to do what I can to, to make things better. Um, so I asked, what can I do to earn my rank back really quickly? What can I do? And, um, so we put a plan in place. I went home for a while. You know, I, I got back with my old recruiter. I went out to all these schools and I'm like signing people up left and right. You know, I was like the queen recruiter at the time. And, you know, and then I took my, my PFT and I was getting all the points I could. And then, um, it was like maybe six weeks later, I was meritoriously promoted back to Lance corporal. Yeah. I worked my butt off for that though. Yeah. I was yeah. determined. I was like, this is not going to happen to me again. Yeah. No way. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a great story. And again, I'd like to m- maybe shape it a bit for the, mm-hmm. the non-Marines out there. So mm-hmm. you, you knew what the standards were and yeah. you, you, mm-hmm. you know, immaturity, you willfully violated them and, and your leaders uh, spanked you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Absolutely. For the for the business people out there, you're going to make mistakes. I have, I still mm-hmm. do, and so you're going to get you're going to get spanked. Now you're not going to get mm-hmm. re- reduced. Uh, now, if you make a big mistake and do something egregious, you could get fired. But yeah. let's forget that for now. So my point is, leaders, much like Jen was talking about, you know, she was a Marine, higher standard, and all of that. Uh, if you are a leader, I think you agree, Jen. When you are a leader, you you must hold yourself to a higher standard. Yeah. Absolutely. And if if you don't, you will get found out sooner or later. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. the flip side of that coin is if you're a leader 
and someone falls short and you do have to discipline them, spank them, mm-hmm. so to speak, don't throw them away. Yeah. Talk to them because that is an environment now where the person's real character is going to, is going to surface. That's right. Because we all have seen both in the Marine Corps and in the business world, people that are superstars. And then at the first friction point, they don't do what you did or what other people did. They crater. Yeah. They absolutely crater. Mm -hmm. And what was a damn fine executive one day Got in a little bit of trouble. They said something, yeah, whatever. And the next thing you know, he is making bad choice after bad choice and fired. Yeah. You know, fired uh, yeah. at three, three months after being considered a superstar and all of that. So kudos to you for the character, the real character, especially at a young age. And I'm yeah. sure that one followed you through life, you know. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it, it was such a great lesson learned for me because, you know what, um, you're going to screw up. We're mm-hmm. human. Congratulations. We're human. Yes. You know, people make mistakes. You know, sometimes we misjudge. But the thing is, what is that lesson that we have learned now? OK, yeah. I made this mistake. How can I grow from this? And I think that staff sergeant's leadership, what he showed to me by taking that time to have that talk with me and then being able to sit with me and say, hey, look, but here is a way to get past this. And you'll end up even stronger, you know, by the end of this, um, that was integral. I mean, to have that level of support from him, you know, that really kind of, that gave me what I needed to say, okay, you know what? Yeah, this isn't the end of the world. I mean, it really was awful. It sucked. You know, I did, I wish I had not done it. However, Hey, look, um, I can get past this. And now in the grand scheme of things, you know, anything that happens, okay, it's not the end of the world. We have a problem. Let's address the problem and let's come up with some solutions and, you know, see what we can do about this. Yeah. You know, there's nothing that we cannot, cannot think about, you know, there's nothing that we can't think of a solution for. Yeah. There's yeah. going to be something we can do. Yeah. And I think, again, a leadership lesson that I'm drawing from this for the leaders now is just don't, don't quit on your people. Yeah. Even yeah. when they get in trouble, that's your job is to it's, it's easy when everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and excelling. But don't quit mm-hmm. on them when they hit a rough patch. Uh, I am. I'm going to tell you an anecdote uh, story. I am aware of someone that oh, this goes way back now. Um, this guy was, I think, at the vice president level. He was very, very talented, but very arrogant. And mm. quite frankly, he pissed off so many people that at one point i was told um he's going to be fired Mm. well the week before he was supposed to get fired his boss came down with a serious illness Mm. where he wasn't going to be able to work for a while a long while and so the ceo came to me and said mike you know uh Steve, not his real name. Steve was going to get fired, deserves to get fired, but we can't fire him right now because Zeb, not his real name, is now in the hospital with a heart attack and blah, blah, blah. And so he he survived. And and damn, Jen, I, if he didn't start doing well. Wow. He, mm-hmm. So he, he, he was a week away from being fired. I don't think he still mm-hmm. knows that. And then by a fluke, he survived to live. And then he started listening and he started doing well, doing well. And I've tracked him. I'm still in touch with him. Three or four companies later, he is a no kidding senior executive making a ton of money. And um, he learned. And so my point is he survived from a fluke. I'm asking leaders to really don't fire somebody ahead of their time. If you feel like doing it, you can still do it six weeks later or six months later. When you do it, be sure. But sometimes all it takes is just sitting them down and talking to them a little bit differently than you have already. You know, just just as some way to get them to see the light. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, and and think about 
the level of responsibility that was given to this guy, Mm. it, it, what did that communicate to him? Yeah. Like, look, we are trusting that Mm -hmm. you're, we're going to place you in this position and this position has a lot of responsibility attached to it, but we're trusting that you are going to be able to handle this. Yeah. And what that must have outside of those words, what did that communicate to him, you know, as, as an aspiring leader, you know, how did that make him feel? How did that make him rethink his relationships, you know, that were within the office? How did that make him see himself in a different way? Yeah. And so now, yeah, I got, I got to rise to this occasion. I think that's a very powerful tool to use. You know, yeah. I'm going to trust that you're, you're the one that we're, we're counting on you Yeah. to make this happen. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, the, the famous Dale Carnegie, the leadership mm-hmm. guy from many decades ago, he's got a very appropriate quote to support what you said. He said, give a man a reputation to live up to. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what this guy was going to get fired. All of a sudden he's Mm -hmm. being temporary elevated in a much senior role. Yeah. Highly visible, very critical role. Mm -hmm. And he, and he lived up to it. He really did. Yeah. That's amazing. It it really is. is It's it's a a success because I tell you, nobody wanted to see this guy fired more than me. Yeah. He was not good to work with. He was yeah. mean spirited. He was not good to work with. And what a me- what a metamorphosis. In fact, right. I talked to somebody in his current company and today people want to work for him because he's got a reputation for being a mentor and developer of leaders. Right. So what a what yeah. a transfer. What a tra- so never. So I would have never bet that would have happened. I, yeah. would have, I would have never thought he was capable of that. So he proved us all wrong and good for him. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, in a way it's really not that surprising because I mean, there, there's research out there that shows, you you know, even at the school level, when you have high expectations, when you raise expectations for students, they will rise to that occasion. Yeah. If we lower expectations, I think it's human nature. Oh, I'm not expected to do this. I, you know, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Okay. Then I'm just not going to give, I'm not going to yes. give my all. I'm not going to go for things, but yeah high expectations and that level of support, you know, and belief that you can do this, Yeah, I agree you know, with and, and, and this is a, this is a place where, you know, you're safe to fail with me because I'm going to be here with you. Yes. You know, that's incredibly powerful um, no doubt. You know, to, to think you know, from, from children all the way up to adults. I mean, yeah. how funny we still, we still need that. Yeah, we do. Well, listen, our time is up and I can't let you out of here, Jim, without asking you the, the fantasy question. If you were given the opportunity to bring back one leader from the past, spend a day with that person, who would it be and why? That is such a great question. I spent a lot of time, probably more time than not thinking about, man, if I could, if I could spend the day with somebody, I definitely wanted to pick someone who I could pick their brain for a while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, also thinking about my experience of of being in the Marine Corps and and being the first female and, you know, some certain instances. Um, You know, I think about there's a woman named Jeanette Rankin. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but she was the first woman ever to be elected to national office. Hmm. And this was in 1916. Wow. So when you think about it, right. Um, women didn't even get the right to vote until 1920. Yeah. So I would love to spend the day with her and go, what the hell did you say? (laughs) We didn't even have the right to vote. What did you say? How did you interact? What was your message? You know, how did you build those relationships Mm. to convince, you know, your constituency to vote you into national office. She was in a house of representatives for the the state of Montana. You know, it's like, how did, how did that happen? We weren't even allowed to vote yet. Yeah. I would love to just, I think that would be a fascinating conversation with yeah. her to just learn what she went through and, um, you know, uh, in, in the challenges that she faced in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had not heard of her. That's a fascinating story. Yeah. 
I was just telling somebody the other night, a, a woman, they looked at me cross-eyed. I think she's about 28 years old. And I said, you know, women, married women could not get credit cards in their name mm -hmm. as, as recently as like the mid eighties. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, sorry, you don't have a job. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I mean, I'm married for 20 years. Right. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Your husband can have a credit card, but not you. Right. Yeah. Bring him in here to sign. <laughs> yes. And so, uh, can, but, but to your point, roll that back 70 years. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, this woman obviously has something going on. So I'm going to look her up. I, that's a, that's yeah. a good, good, tip, good choice. Well, listen, I think our listeners are going to want to know more about you. How, how do we find you? How do, how do people contact you? Yeah, sure. The best way, uh, two ways. Number one, go to my website, www.communication247.com. And it's all spelled out, no numbers. Um, the second best way is I'm on LinkedIn. And so if you find me on LinkedIn, connect with me, shoot me a DM, let's have a conversation. I'd love to yeah. see how I can be of service. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jen, I can't thank you enough for your time investment. It's been a great episode. This is going to be a popular one among the crowd. So thanks again. And I humbly and selfishly ask that you consider coming back again for another episode sometime. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You just make the ask and I will say yes. Okay. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. It's all, pleasure's all mine and go forth and lead well. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Please subscribe, rate, review, and recommend to your friends. Please visit our website at FidelisLeadership.com and sign up for our leadership newsletter. Until next time, remember the words of the ancient Greek philosopher Heracles. What you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but is woven in the lives of others.